Hello, listeners. As an enhancement to your listening experience, I am now going to present these archive episodes unedited in their entirety, which includes all of my afterthoughts. So, continue listening after the outro music if you want to hear what I thought of the episode. And if you are enjoying the podcast, please support it by going to the homepage spacerockethistory.com and clicking on the orange donate button or the Patreon link. And now I can also accept Zelle and Venmo. Just use my email address, spacerockethistory at gmail.com. Thanks. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. In God's speed, John Glenn. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Can I feel out? Okay, I'm out. How does it feel for the United States to be the new record holder? At last, huh? When that baby light, there's no doubt about it. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Listen, uh... Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Hello and welcome. This is Michael Annis, and you're listening to episode 255 of the Space Rocket History Podcast. And now, Apollo 12, Lunar Liftoff. Continuing from the previous episode, Moonwalk 2 was completed and Pete and Al were back inside Intrepid. The first order of business was the post-EVA checklist, which involved turning off radio contact through their suits and establishing radio contact directly through the lunar module's radio. Also, removing their portable life support system, the PLSS, and preparing the jettison bag. Now we don't have anything left but a little rendezvous. <laughs> it was quite a bit more than just a rendezvous. As they proceeded through the checklist, they were very aware there wasn't much room in the cabin, and they had to constantly turn to reach circuit breakers, valves, and switches. But... They didn't bump anything hard enough with the PLSS to change a setting or break anything off. Other crews, as we know, were not that lucky. But there was never any unrecoverable situation. The frequent checks of circuit breaker and switch settings prevented any such change from going long without notice. So far we haven't touched one of those circuit breakers. Pete and Al reestablished communication with Houston at 135 hours 32 minutes mission elapsed time. Intrepid, Houston. Intrepid, uh, hooked up on the uh, Intrepid system. How do you read? We read you loud and clear, Pete, and we're standing by to give you any help on the storage you may need. And when you get down to it, we also have some good words for you on uh, how to. Uh, Stow the TV camera. Okay, uh, we'll uh, wait for a while. Let us get through our checklist, please. Roger. Since the lunar module cabin was small and weight margins for the return to lunar orbit were tight, jettison bags were used to keep the cabin free of trash, such as food wrappers and urine bags, and of equipment that was no longer needed, including the hammocks, their boots, and the equipment transfer bag, to name a few. Then they collected the remaining feed water from the portable life support systems and weighed it and reported the weights to Houston. We're going to go ahead with our jettison here shortly. Roger. Hello, Houston Intrepid. Intrepid Houston, go ahead. Roger, Commander's feed water remaining, 0.32 kg. 0.32 kilograms. 
That's right, and we'll have the LMP for you in just a minute. Roger. This in the LMP's water is point two six. Point two six. Now Conrad and Bean put the water bags and the scale in the jettison bag, removed Pete's remaining forearm rest and put it in the jettison bag, and got the portable life support systems in position to jettison them. Then they donned their gloves and performed a pressure integrity check of their suits. When they were ready, they depressurized the cabin, unlocked the hatch, and used up the remaining camera film taking pictures out the window. After finishing with the photos, they stowed the camera film magazine for return to Earth, and then put the cameras and other unneeded gear in the disposable left-hand side stowage compartment for jettisoning. Houston, as soon as we get through our suit integrity check, we'll be depressing the cabin for the jettison. Roger, interpret. Once the pressure was relieved from the cabin and equal to the vacuum of space, they opened the hatch and jettisoned all the equipment and trash. Interpret Houston, come check. Loud and clear, the equipment's jettisoned. We're just cleaning up the cockpit. Sorry. Roger, Pete. Uh, we copy uh, two impacts on the PSE during jettison. That's plus one and plus two. Roger. Uh, they were, as a matter of fact, uh, as a matter of fact, that may help you calibrate that thing because let me, uh, I got a clean kick on both of them. In other words, when they left the hatch, uh, they departed the hatch and went free fell all the way to the ground without touching the ladder or anything on the way. Okay, they pretty much went straight out and uh, on a ballistic right on down and hit the ground. Didn't uh, arc up at all? That's, ri That's right. Okay, thank you. Once the cabin was repressurized, the astronauts removed their helmets and gloves and proceeded with the cabin cleanup checklist. In the meantime, Houston contacted the person Conrad and Bean would be rendezvousing with. Dick Gordon in Yankee Clipper, and they gave him some map updates. Hello, Dick. Pete and Al are uh, just finishing up the uh, post EVA, and it looks as though they're pretty far ahead. I have a little bit of time to sit back and relax. We have a uh, map update for Rev 29 when you're ready to copy. Back on Intrepid, Pete and Al completed the cabin cleanup checklist. Just at Intrepid, uh, we have everything stowed, secured properly. Uh, we're ready to uh, start the launch countdown at the proper time. And if you'll give us about 15 or 20 minutes to chow down here, we'll come back with you and have a little chitty chat about the EVA. Roger, Pete. That sounds like a good plan. And Pete, uh, you're still uh, quite a bit ahead. Looks as though the furthest uh, you could go up to in the checklist is on surface 101. Lift off minus 240. Uh, you'll have to hold at that point until uh, we get you the right uh, CSM state vector. Okay, no problem. I'm not. Uh, I'm not hustling on that. We're, we're we're just sitting here now. We got the spacecraft all squared away. I'm saying everything's tied down. But man, oh man, is it filthy in here? We must have 20 pounds of dust, dirt, and all kinds of junk. Roger, Pete. That'll be an interesting zero G. Right, Al and I make. Uh, Looks like a couple of bituminous coal miners right at the moment. But we're happy. So are a lot of people down here. So Pete and Al had some time to kill. First they ate lunch, 
Then they debriefed Houston about the moonwalks, and finally they started into the checklist for liftoff. They were about an hour ahead of schedule, and when they came to the T-30 minutes mark in the count, they stopped, because the next steps, pressurizing the fuel tanks, for example, would have to wait until the proper time. So, Conrad tried to rest. Then he looked at Bean. Al seemed nervous. There was absolutely nothing to do but watch the clock. But Bean was fidgeting with something on one of the instrument panels. Conrad wondered what he was thinking. Pete remembered how he had felt on his own first space flight, Gemini 5, crammed into that tiny spacecraft with Gordo Cooper after a week in orbit Circling the Earth over and over, Conrad found himself thinking about the Gemini 5's retro rockets, which had been soaking in the frigid cold of space for days on end, longer than anybody had ever been in space before. Conrad was terrified that when it came time to fire the retros, nothing would happen, in which case he was sure he would slit his wrist. But, When Gemini 5's retros fired right on schedule, he breathed a huge sigh of relief. Now on the moon, Conrad was sure Bean was going through the same drill about the ascent engine, and he was right. Ever since the lunar module had come to a stop on the ocean of storms, Bean had been aware of what it would take to leave. He and Conrad were like a pair of motorists trying to cross the Sahara, who had stopped their car for 30 hours, ate, had a good look around, and took a nap. Now they were going to try to start the engine again, with no one to give them a jump start if it didn't work. Finally, Conrad said, Bino, are you worried about the engine? Bean answered a quiet, Yep. And Conrad tried a bit of humor, saying, Well, there's no sense worrying about it, Al, because if it don't work, we're just going to become the first permanent monument to the space program. Conrad wasn't sure the joke made any difference in Bean's outlook. But an hour later, when the moment of truth arrived, there were no unpleasant surprises. Here is... The uninterrupted liftoff from the moon. Loud and clear, Pete. Right here. Checklist is complete. Standing by for tick minus two. Roger. Tick minus two. 400 plus 10. Set your watch. I set that in one minute. And start. Roger, Clipper. Howdy, Yankee. Howdy, Yankee Clipper. Okay, very good. On my mic, Yankee Clipper, it'll be one minute. Mark, one minute. Master arm is on. 367 read. Got it. Push it, 30 seconds, Pete. Roger. The aircraft and I'll fly the bird. That's good to me. Pretty far. Fifty flank. Average G. Award stage. Engine arm pass in. All we like is pro and then afterwards engine yep. start. Okay. Twenty seconds. Looking good, Pete. Okay. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, five, three, two, one, lift off. And away we go. Okay, did it fire? Joy? Good. 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 It didn't get the L set. Ended up in Houston. Copy. Okay. Mission guidance looks Pick good. Pickover's looking good. Okay. 
Boy, you sure can nice and quiet, isn't it? Final, I don't know what. Mark, 30 seconds. 30 seconds, 177, 94.6, and out of 1,900 feet. That's pretty good. We're on our way. And in one minute, y'all right 20 feet. Okay. All right, there's it. Say again. The program looks good. Kind of wobbles around up here, doesn't it? Yeah, it's right Houston, looking good in one minute. Okay, we've got right 20. Steaming right down the pipe. Okay. Well, that's good. Nice. Pressures look good, Pete. What a nice ride. RCS is right in there. Two counts yeah. every time those pressures start. Yeah, quite smooth. It's a good run. It's a good part of it. All right, 1 plus 30, 745, and it's 56. We're at a 9,000 feet. Good jumpy. Okay, it's just changing CG. I know it. So smooth. What a neat old ride. <laughs> Maybe it's pitching over, it's right on a pitch profile. Two minutes. 1,061, 175, and 20. And some of you can go at two. Just a little bit higher. That year. Everything looks good, Pete. Looks sure good. it does. Looks like some of the same territory we passed over before. That's just <laughs> things and ads agree perfectly. Roger. Okay. Mark. Two minutes and 30 seconds. Looking at 1373, 187, climbing out of 19,700. Houston, you better clear me out of flight level 240 for flight level 600. Roger. Squawk 2 1. Okay, he's walking two one. That's your high game, my gal. High okay. game looks real good, Pete. Hang it in there. Mark, three minutes. Seventeen fifty two, hundred and ninety four, climbing out of twenty five thousand. Houston, separate the camera and transmit DHF also. Say again, Dick. Dick would like you to transmit on VHF. Roger, I am transmitting on VHF. Three minutes and 30 seconds, Al. 2,130 feet per second, climbing 193, and we're at a 31,600. Okay. Hammer went off sometime after liftoff. I hope it got the outset. Still running. I turned it back on. Oh, I see. Wonder why we got the master alarm. I never did see anything. Uh, I didn't either. Everything looks good. Pull up a Houston, you're looking good as four. Twenty five hundred foot. Climbing out of thirty seven thousand. Okay. Ooh, look at that uh grill down there. Wow. There goes uh part of Landsberg, I think, there on the left. Hey, but the camera stopped again, see? Forget it. Alright, 430. 2,954 feet. This is a hot machine. 173, climbing out of 42,800. Thanks for happy. Hey. Okay. Alien pressures look good. Start to move around a little bit more now as we lighten up. Okay, you got a big job now. Don't forget to ask that piece. the right thing I'm thinking about them since you lift it off. Okay, five minutes. Mark, five minutes. 34.03, out of 60, now to 47,000. Intrepid Houston, you're looking good at five. The Harbor Master is carried into the main plant channel. Thank you. Really getting down there. 
Physics with lunar surface physics. Day 5 plus 30. Okay. All right. Man, look at that crater we're flying okay. over. Okay. And it's hollow 500. We would have joined. 70. 100. Okay. 4,000. Because we've got 1,400 feet per second to go. Okay. At a mark at six minutes. Six minutes. Six minutes, 43.82. Okay, I'm going to get over on verb 16, down 85 right now. This thing's running a little bit hot. Okay, 900 feet according to the ag. Okay. These with you, and it's you're picking up fast. Okay. 37. Okay. Edge a little bit more than you. Okay. Then in back for 700 feet to go. Then in back for 200 feet per second. 21 to go. 600 feet. Now you got 500 feet to go. Wow, we're really poking along. 5. 475. 439. Looking good. 400. And then back. 327 feet. Okay. Oh, main shot off open. Okay. Open. Open they go. Just a main didn't open. Okay. But if close as it feeds, half. Yeah. Oh, good to see it. It just opened. Okay. Now be setting the board stage. You can arm off. Okay. Okay. Okay, I gotta back off 32 feet. What they say. You see that, Houston? After alarm, but I don't know for what. Everything looks okay. But Houston, we do. Hey, what happened? I got to watching that problem, and I let her oversee. Oh, okay. Okay. It didn't uh, help that stage ray, and I just figured we could close okay. them. And Houston, how do you read? Clear, Pete. Okay. Does that look satisfactory to you? Looks good, Pete. We copied your overbird, and uh, we see your turning now. Okay, I took it all out. Uh, I got interested in this. Uh, yeah, I'm here to clip on the AHF. Aim shut off valve A, indicated barber pole. Got you, Clipper. I recycled it twice and then said uh, shut off both ascent feet and left the cross feet open as it is now. And I'm going to close the cross Okay, both control two of the ad holes. They are. Okay. Further two. The inverter one open. Okay. Yeah, on inverter two. I am on inverter two. And stop it. Okay. Uh, this is Houston. Find uh, your engine stop push button. Yeah. Get her. Sorry about that. <laughs> Everything's off. Okay. Okay. Now, turn the light to track. Wait, is this a dirty spacecraft? In here? Can we go off box? Yep. Clipper, Houston, we're setting up the relay now. I wonder why he's not pressed to the EHF. Intrepid, uh, Houston, Clipper is not reading his EHF. We're configuring for misfit relay now. Good, uh, Yankee Clipper, how do you read Houston now? We're in the relay mode. Hello, Yankee Clipper, Intrepid, how do you read? Uh, yeah, you the did you read Clipper's answer? Yeah, I read him. After a total of 31.6 hours on the moon, the lunar module ascent stage fired for about seven minutes. As the ocean of storms fell away in one last spectacular view, Pete Conrad and Al Bean headed for a reunion with a best friend in lunar orbit. The initial burn 
put Intrepid into an orbit of 10 miles by 54 miles. A preliminary look at the burn status indicated an overburn of one and one-half seconds, which was trimmed out by Conrad as he was removing his residuals from the burn. Now Alan Bean was looking out the window. It was the first chance he had had to relax and play tourist since arriving at the moon more than two days earlier. He thought about how strange it felt to orbit the moon. The strangest thing about it was the silence. There wasn't any engine noise, the way there always was in an airplane. And it felt odd to see the spacecraft fly in the same direction no matter how it was pointed. To Bean, orbiting the moon was much more of a science fiction experience than walking on it had been. Flying in space was better than Bean had ever imagined during those long years as a rookie. While in lunar orbit, Intrepid made several burns in order to intercept Yankee Clipper. When it came to the last burn, Conrad did something unusual. He told Bean, Why don't you just quit after this mid-course burn and relax and enjoy it? You can take a minute and fly this vehicle. Startled by Pete's audacity, Bean wondered, wouldn't it put them off course? No, Conrad said. Whatever digressions they made would be easy to correct. Bean was reluctant. Surely Mission Control would know. Conrad laughed. Not on the back side of the moon they won't. Bean realized Conrad had planned this perfectly, and for a few minutes, Bean had his hand at the crisp, responsive ascent stage. It was a moment that Bean would always remember as pure Pete Conrad, that in a small craft somewhere over the far side of the moon, he had taken the time to share with Bean a flying experience that even most astronauts would never know. Salutations from the foothills of North Carolina. This is Michael Annis, your host, and I wanted to say thanks for listening to episode number 255 of the Space Rocket History Podcast, entitled Apollo 12, Lunar Liftoff. Hope you enjoyed this episode. It was a pleasure to bring it to you. I want to give a big shout out to all my longtime listeners. Thanks for staying subscribed and extend a warm welcome to my new listeners. I'm glad you're here. In case you haven't noticed, I have added some more episodes to the Archive Podcast. We now have episodes 1 through 64 available on iTunes, Google Play, and all your favorite podcatchers. Just look for the Space Rocket History Archive. I'll try to get some more up next month with the goal of ultimately catching up with the main podcast, RSS Feed. Today... We salute the Salyut Skylab donors. There is one so far this year. Salyut Skylab donors contribute $60 or more during the calendar year. Thank you for your continued support, Salyut Skylab donors. Okay, had a few afterthoughts on this week's episode. I want to credit my sources first. A Man on the Moon by Andrew Chaikin. Failure is Not an Option by Gene Krantz. Rocket Man by Nancy Conrad. The Apollo 12 Flight Journal, the Apollo 12 Lunar Surface Journal, and Apollo An Eyewitness Account by Alan Bean. Well, Al was genuinely concerned about that ascent engine working, and he freely admitted that in his book. That was their only way off the moon. So if it didn't work, they were stuck. But the veteran Pete Conrad seemed not to bother him. He was pretty sure it was going to work. But consider this. 
It was only the second manned moon landing. Only Apollo 11 had proved the engine would work. So no one had a lot of experience with this engine on the moon. So I really understand where Al was coming from. Well, you heard Pete mention that it was really dirty inside of the Intrepid with all that moon dust they brought in. I wonder how Dick Gordon is going to react to that when they want to come into the clean command module. <laughs> Probably a little negatively. <laughs> I wonder how they are going to prevent tracking that dust in the command module. I know they use that uh, vacuum thing and We'll see more about that uh, next time. I thought it was uh, very nice of Pete to let Al fly the lunar module a little on the far side of the moon when nobody could see them. <laughs> After all, Al Bean's title is Lunar Module Pilot. So come on, let him fly just a little bit. I I'm sure Al really appreciated that. Okay, I have posted some pictures and the audio for this episode on my homepage, spacerockethistory.com. Hope you check that out. I was pleased to receive five new donations in support of the podcast over the past two weeks. Ben O. from Australia donated at the Apollo level and earned his rocket emoji. Charles B. donated at the Mercury level. Scott Y. from Ohio donated at the Vostok level. Angus W. donated at the Sputnik level, and 2010 LuxMad pledged on Patreon at the Vostok level. This brings our total Patreons to 170, and we have a goal of reaching 218 by the end of the year. Our overall donors for this year have reached 260, with a goal of reaching 418 in 2018. For those of you who are enjoying the content provided here and have not donated yet in 2018, please consider supporting the podcast if you're financially able. Keep in mind, Space Rocket History is entirely listener-funded. I depend upon your financial support to keep the podcast going. It's easy to support the podcast. Simply go to the homepage, spacerockethistory.com, click on the orange Donate button or the Patreon link, all donors are rewarded with their name on the donor's page at the level they choose to donate. Now, for those of you who have already donated for 2018, I certainly appreciate it. I have a surprise to give away this week, and I'm not going to say what it is. Instead, it will be a surprise to the lucky winner. To select the winner, Mrs. SRH gave every 2018 donor a number. Then she put it into Google's random number generator and got the number for Neil Kroll. That's Neil Kroll. If you would email me, mike at spacerockethistory.com, tell me your address and I will mail this out to you. I was pleased to see the podcast received five new five-star ratings on iTunes over the past couple of weeks. I wanted to thank AwareWolf23 and Eli Burks for the very kind review and the five-star rating, and also the three other anonymous people who gave the podcast the all-important five-star rating. We are at 295 ratings for the podcast and just five short of 300. Also on the archive podcast, we had two more five-star ratings on that, and I certainly appreciate that, whoever did it. Thank you. This is the end of content for this episode. You're welcome to stay and listen to my off-topic thoughts if you want. Thanks for sticking around, folks. We are almost finished with Apollo 12. I expect to end next week or the week after, just depending on how much information I find that I want to share. Then, we will finally be out of the 60s. We will be past 1969, and the next big thing coming up will be Apollo 13. Well, folks, I survived jury duty last week, and let me tell you, that was not a pleasant experience. 
12 people plus two alternates make up a jury. There were a total of 65 potential jury members at the courthouse that day. I was last Monday that I was chosen from. And I got picked as number four. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> I, I just told me, I don't get it. It was uh, a criminal felony case. So we, it took the week to, to hear all the testimony and all that and all that stuff. I think, I think I would rather have a root canal than serve on another jury. <laughs> At least a root canal is over in a couple hours. Okay, folks, that's about all I have for today. I hope to have episode 256 posted by next Thursday. So long for now.